Hey everybody, Jazzy here. Apologies for the delay in this week's recap. My schedule is different from week to week, and this week I happen to have had exactly zero time outside of streaming to edit videos. But I didn't forget about you. The series is still going strong, and these videos mean a lot to me. Next week, I will definitely have more time to focus on editing. But without further ado, here is the recap for year 22 of Thrill of the Grill, my solo Warly world over on Twitch. First night of autumn, I'm running the Moonrock farm, and there's still a few bugs to work out with the design. I'm running into an issue once the event starts where hounds start biting the walls of my bait pen when they disassociate with the Varg. This is typical behavior for non-Varg hounds, but it's odd that they don't immediately start pathfinding towards the Moonstone, it's almost like their AI takes a moment to update their priorities. And I'm worried that if too many hounds start biting the walls before they realize that the Moonstone is happening, they'll destroy my bait pens every time the event starts. It's going to be compounded when we get more Vargs in here, so I'm observing the issue now and considering how to eventually correct for it. I'm also doing a big stone fruit harvest, picking up the sprouts, burning the fruit, and my server in the process then grabbing the rocks. Considering the 1% chance of a sprout for mining stone fruit, I'd say four sprouts from a harvest of over 700 stone fruit is a pretty rotten haul. I'm looking forward to having enough sprouts to complete the build and just not have to think about fertilizing them anymore. After dozens of hunts, we finally encounter Varg number two. I'm gonna need to turn the entire deciduous force into a koala preserve after all this hunting. But the telelocator in the new pen is all fired up. We just need to drag the Varg closer and teleport poof it in. Now I did switch to the beta branch of the March quality of life update mainly because I was interested in some of the functionality they were adding for repeat actions. The idea is that double clicking and holding down the mouse button will now allow for certain actions to be repeated for as long as you want. It's not quite as hands off as the action cue mod and it's not meant to be, but it does mean that you won't need to repeatedly click that craft button every time you want to refine like boards or rope. So that is a nice improvement. In the early days of the beta, the mechanics were still a bit buggy. For example, it was possible for the crafting to continue indefinitely if you moused out of the crafting menu while crafting. But all things considered, I welcome any improvement to a command system that necessitates spam clicking. I got a hound wave while dragging the Varg through Deciduous. I was close enough to my hound trap, so I decided to just put the Varg to sleep and deal with the hounds first. It's amazing how many sketchy situations can be saved with a pan flute, especially when it comes to hounds. I try to keep one on me every time I'm dealing with Vargs, but eventually we managed to drag the Varg close enough to the Moonstone and telelocate him safely inside. Again, the reason you drag him closer first is so that the hounds don't get stuck in an unloaded ocean when they run to the Varg's new location. On the very same day that Varg 2 gets a home, we find Varg number three. I don't yet have the third pen fully prepared and the deciduous trees are ready to harvest, so I'm gonna leave him and come back. A few days later, the telelocator is loaded up and the inside walls have been lined with statues. And on day 1486, I'm bringing the Varg on home. Do not ever drop food near a Varg because the hounds will make a beeline for the food. I cracked my food bundle while dragging and they almost scarfed 24 mokeka in one bite. So now the Varg is in the pen, but not all the hounds made it to the moon rock. Check it out, one of them got stuck on a petrified tree. If you leave it here then, it will always count as one and prevent the Varg from summoning the maximum possible number of hounds. By the way, I figured I'd let chat name the rest of the Vargs for the build, so say hello to Meatball and Chompy. Welcome aboard! We are going to make lots of beautiful glass doggos together. And on day 1491, they get their first chance to show us what they can do. Seems like on average they each spawn like four to five hounds per howl. So with the starting family and assuming they howl twice before the event ends, that's like 15 hounds per Varg. So with three Vargs, I'm gonna expect something like 60 to 70 Moonrock per event. I mean, that's pretty good, but a fourth Varg is gonna be better. And spring rolls around with nary a clops to be seen. She was supposed to come around day 1493, but it's possible that the beta messed with her reset timer. I missed her this time, but whatever, I'll wipe away my frozen tears with moon rock. It's time to finally pick the wood from the autumn harvest. I do appreciate that this activity can be put off until it's more convenient. Picking and crafting logs typically take a couple days, and I'm not always ready to throw down that kind of time if I'm in the middle of building something. I've also been trying to fish at these wobster dens whenever I see one swimming around. It's just really nice being able to grab one or two and pop them into the bin. 
Then, if I ever wanted to make some bisque, I can just grab them from here. I use a dusky spoon, but I'd be better off with a spinnerbait. This year, we found a brand new claw spawner in the deciduous forest. I may have fought claws here in the early days of the world, but it's definitely been since before I started marking and blocking them. This spawner is gonna get blocked. And the loot from this year's Kloss will contain lovely Krampus sack number four. I'm placing some furnaces around the Moonstone. It tends to get cold around here with all the polar lights, so I would like to have some heat sources. I don't know if it's intentional, but I noticed that most of the building around here is fireproof. It makes sense, especially if we're going to be working with firehounds. But I'm also trying to avoid places where hounds running toward the Moonstone could potentially get stuck, so I need to be careful with any structures with larger collision boxes, such as end tables and furnaces. I run the Moonstone event again on day 1511, and this time the hounds absolutely obliterate the bait pens. I need to rebuild and rebait these before I can start to mine the suspicious moon rock from this event, otherwise the hounds will attack me if I get too close to one of the vargs. I had some conversations with Gabriel, and next time I know how I'm going to prevent this. It'll just take a bit more preparation before each event, but it will run much more smoothly. Day 1517, I'm moving the road so that we enter the build up the middle from the bottom. That will allow me to design two symmetrical areas underneath the build, and from there I can start to build more around this biome. Day 1519, I'm low on glowberry moose, so I'm running the forest stalker. This has become one of my favorite late game farms, mainly because it's just so simple. Aside from the thermal fuel, it's basically free to run and can provide so many different resources. Light bulbs for refueling light sources, lesser glowberries for moose, and foliage for slimy turf. It is also the most convenient way of restoring sanity with a bee queen crown which is why I find myself using it a lot in summer when the nights are still long, but I'm not wearing the tam. Day 1521, I'm cooking up some more meaty stew for the bundle. Now that I've added honey ham to the mix, I find myself alternating between honey ham and mokeka for meals, depending on how much health and sanity I need. But meaty stew is always the first thing I eat when I crack my bundle, so it seems like it depletes the fastest. I really don't mind. Between the werepig farm, the lure plant boats, and the hound trap, I always have plenty of meat on hand for making stew. Now, one highly requested boss fight in this run has been the level 3 Shadow Knight. So I'm gonna try it here. I've never done it before in a survival world, so this will be a first for me. But we have a problem. The hounds start barking right before the fight. I had the option to bail, but I really wanted to do the fight, so I hammered the pieces and I just quickly killed the bishop. It wasn't too difficult with the spicy Volko jelly, only took like a few hits to kill the first piece. This leveled up both the rook and the knight. Now, before I kill the rook, I'm going to use its area of effect attack to kill the hounds. The level 2 bishop also has an area of effect, but it's not nearly as strong. Plus, it won't aggro the hounds, so it's harder to maneuver them effectively. The rook, on the other hand, will chomp down right where I was a moment ago and kill any ice hounds instantly. Once the hounds are gone, I finish up the rook and the knight gets fully upgraded. Now, the knight attacks a lot, and it's impossible to dodge on foot even with speed modifiers. So I'm using the same tactic that I've been using recently recently with the wear pigs triple bone armor with one equipped and the other two in inventory slots 2 and 3 I alternate between swapping out from each slot. This keeps all three bone armor cycling through and allows for all the hits to be completely negated. We took 11 hits before killing it, so we negated about 1650 points of damage. I could have probably pulled it off with a couple pieces of Thulacite gear and about 165 HP worth of healing, but without the damage boost it would be much more expensive to tank, so I definitely would not recommend doing this unless you had the bone armor to spare. Following that entirely unnecessary necessary waste of nightmare fuel, I'm looking to refill my gold chests, so I'm making a trip to the Pig King for the first time in several hundred days. I like to visit only when I absolutely need gold, because a single stack of frazzled wires will more than fill a chest with gold. So it's way more space efficient to just hold on to the wires and trade to Pig King only as needed. Early summer, I'm back at the Moonstone clearing up the entryway to the main area. Now, I don't generally build a lot in forests because of the ridiculous regrowth, but I do know that at this point there's not much use in clearing out too many trees. As far as I know, only structures and crafted flooring will prevent regrowth, so if I'm making natural zones, then I won't bother clearing the trees until I'm ready to place down some structures. I killed Antlion, and for the first time ever, she did not spawn any glass castles. This is likely a bug with the beta branch. But regardless, it actually made the fight much more challenging. I never realized until now that I use her castle summoning animation to sneak in a lot of extra hits. 
and it provides a momentary reprieve to the constant kiting. Fighting her without that summon is exhausting and takes even more concentration than it typically does. Day 1529, I'm finally putting the finishing touches on the Gecko Pen, ironically one of the first builds I did at this base. I decided to throw up a rainometer and thermal measure onto the carpets above the pen. They're relatively cheap structures, and they look nice. I was totally geared up to fight the Pigs on day 1531, when the hound started barking like clockwork at the top of night. This game is amazing, but sometimes I question some of the more random elements because it really knows how to throw stuff at me at the worst possible time. I dealt with the hounds at the trap, then rushed back to start killing pigs. I managed to get through 9 of them before the night ended, so it wasn't totally a lost cause, but it still annoyed the hell out of me. I hemmed and hawed over these bottom corner spots for the gecko zone, but I eventually settled on this design, which used two different stone wall skins at varying heights, with a glass spike sitting on top of a few completely busted down walls. I'm also throwing up some final stone wall decor on the sides and the top. I try to avoid overusing the broken wall aesthetic, but I think it lines certain turfs such as Moon Crater, exceptionally well. Day 1535, I'm finishing up another little zone above the pen. This will be a small bunny man zone surrounded by flowers, berry bushes, and birch nut trees. Nothing super fancy here, just a little zone that could be appreciated on its own. I almost always plant flowers around moon dials because they give that fancy birdbath look to it. That's it for year 22. Next year we got more building, more fuel weavering, more ruinsing, and more yucasing. But we finally get all four Vargs into the pen and can really start grinding out moon rock. Hope you enjoy the recaps, and maybe next time we can catch you live over on Twitch. Take care.